Dr. Bradley Hope. He's a, a pediatrician and historian from Gettysburg. He wrote the book, authored the book of that is Stevens in Gettysburg, The Making of an Abolitionist, and he's here to discuss that with us. Thank you. possibly a little enjoyment, but certainly provide you with a huge amount of information. And I am reminded of the time I was on the Southwest plane, airplane sitting at the end of the runway waiting to take off when the stewardess came over the intercom and sweetly said, hold on tight kitties because we're going to go real fast. <laughs> and that would be my advice today. Hold on tight because we're going to go real fast. If the child is the father of the man, then perhaps the young man shapes the old. A brief look at Stevens' childhood reveals at least three major stressors in his life. He had a left club foot at a time when some folks believed that physical deformities were a mark of the devil. Research today tells us that such children with obvious physical deformities are more likely to experience peer rejection, perceive themselves as victims, gravitate toward adults, have fewer friendships and fewer intimate relationships. Also, researchers have looked at males who grow up in poverty and find that they are at greater risk for development of a high level of activity, which Stephen certainly had if you look at the accomplishments during his life, and also oppositional behavior, which I think we can see in <laughs> Stephen's quite clearly. <laughs> Stephen's also grew up in a family where some people allege that his father was an alcoholic. There were the local stories of a hard drinking man who eventually abandoned his family, and one of Stevens' father's grandsons surely was an alcoholic himself. Sons of alcoholic fathers are at increased risk for development of guilt, depression, irritability, and poor impulse control. And this is all interesting to speculate, but we're not going to talk about Stevens' childhood today. We are going to talk about Stevens as a young man. He was 24 years old when he rode into Gettysburg, and he maintained friendships and business interests in Gettysburg for the rest of his life. He lived in Gettysburg for a third of his life, from 1816 to 1842. It took him about a third of his life to get to Gettysburg, a third of his life in Gettysburg, and then a third of his life in Lancaster and Washington, D.C. <coughs> We wish to understand his actions in Congress at the end of his life. We would be wise to examine his early adult experiences and development. Let's take a look and identify our subject. Tim, you want to hit the uh, first, uh, the first hey, slide? This is one of the earliest known representations of Thaddeus Stevens. This is uh, owned by Gettysburg College and uh, hangs in Pennsylvania Hall. This is uh, Stevens, is painted by Jacob Eichholz, circa 1838. You will notice several things. Number one, there is a building in the background, and this is Pennsylvania Hall that Stevens was so proud of obtaining an $18,000 state appropriation for building. You will see in his hands a piece of paper some people feel that this is his on the school law speech, which he gave in 1835. You will notice something else also, <coughs> and that is, he looks pretty handsome. <laughs> and uh, Jacob Eichholz was known to pretty up. <laughs> so that uh, you will uh, see less of a resemblance here than you see in the later, later photographs. Also, you will notice something else. This is 1830, circa 1838. Certainly by 1830, Betty Stevens was born. And so all of the images after him should appear with a wig that he was wearing. If he was wearing this wig. It certainly is not the wig that he wore for the rest of his life. 
because it's not the typical tri-corner wig <coughs> which Stevens is known uh, for wearing. Uh, his nose isn't quite as broad, his eyes aren't quite as deep set, and the corners of his mouth are not quite as turned down as uh, those in other images that we see. Let's come to the next image, please. <coughs> This is an image that I didn't know existed until about two months ago. Uh, we, of course, in Gettysburg are in the uh, throes of uh, rehabilitating Schmucker Hall to the tune of $13 million, and that is a successful uh, venture and will open officially on July 1, 2013. The Historical Society has been inhabiting Schmucker Hall, and when you move out of one place and move into another place, you physically have to handle things that you have. So if you have a huge collection, you find things that you didn't know were there. This was found in the collection of Elsie Singmaster, who wrote the historical fiction I speak for Thaddeus Stevens. And what's fascinating is, I've never seen this published, perhaps some of you have seen it before, but I have never seen it. It says quite clearly at the bottom, Honorable Thaddeus Stevens. And the other thing that is exciting to me is the engraver, his name. And this engraver reads Draper and Welsh and Company, Philadelphia and New York. Bless their hearts, they had many mergers over those years, and so they kept changing their names under which they operated. Draper and Welsh, Philadelphia and New York, only provided engravings under that name from 1851 to 1854. 1851 to 1854. Prior to 1851, Draper and Welsh were different companies. After 1854, Jocelyn was included in the name. This is one of the earliest images that I have uh, seen as an engraving of Stevens. Certainly there are others uh, uh, which I would love to see also. You see the typical. Uh, wig which he wore later, the broad set nose, the deep eyes, and the slight downturn of uh, the corners of the mouth. Tim, please. This is a from a carte de visite, and once again you see the typical wig, which you see in all three of these uh, later series, the typical downturn of the mouth, the broad set uh, nose, and the deep set eyes. This uh, is a carte de visite that was manufactured at Gill's City Gallery, 20 East King Street, and they only operated at that location in 1857. So this is a photograph of Daddy Stevens, 1857. And Tim, the last photograph, which is typical, and uh, just about everybody has seen these. This is uh, Matthew Brady from 1865, and I just wanted to show you the progression of the <coughs> last ones in a row. 1851 or 54, thereabouts, 1857, 1865. Today we're going to talk about Thaddeus Stevens in Gettysburg, the making of an abolitionist. Donna died in the quiet darkness. The murder was the talk of the town. People stood on quiet street corners and gossips found that the name of Thaddeus Stevens played to a wide audience. Didn't someone say that on the very day of her death, Dinah named Stevens as the father of her unborn child? Didn't Black Peter say that he had gotten many a 50 cent piece from Thaddeus Stevens for calling Dinah out of the tavern where she lived and worked? How did Stevens manage to get appointed to the coroner's jury and didn't he argue against the verdict of murder? Wasn't it Stevens who quashed the reward for information Autumn rumors swirled through the town. Dinah died on September 23rd, 1824. Next day, townspeople found her body in two or three feet of water in a shallow well outside the Gettysburg Presbyterian Church on the northwest edge of town. The young, pregnant, unmarried African-American lay face down, and she had a collection of blood under the skin near her right eye. Whether she'd been hit when she, whether she'd been dead when she went into the water, or whether she'd been struck unconscious when into the water and drowned, was unknown. In 1824, it was medically impossible to determine with certainty the race of the unborn child's father. Nevertheless, the examining physician did not know this. 
and testify that the father of Dinah's child was white. Rumors about Dinah naming Stevens as father and statements by African-American tavern waiter Peter Stewart that Stevens often paid him to call out Dinah caused tongues to wag. During the next seven years, Stevens was the victim of 11 libelous, anonymous letters to the editor published by Jacob Lefebvre in his Gettysburg newspaper, The Compiler. The letters were vicious. The letter of March 9, 1825 was typical. Even the children have come to the knowledge of it. For one day when the person suspected passing, where passed where a number of them were at play, one of them in a low voice says to his companion, I don't see on any blood on that fellow's hands, his mother said there was. Oh, said the other, you see, he keeps one of his hands in his pocket. I suppose that is the one that's money. The murder for which Thaddeus Stevens was liable was never solved. But the story proved cannon fodder for Stevens' enemies and fascinated his biographers for almost 200 years. Information has recently serviced that Peter Stewart, the African-American waiter who came for Dinah, at the tavern the very night she was murdered, the last man known to have seen her alive knew that she was dead before her body was discovered, and he knew where her body lay hours before others. That is, Stevens is no longer the prime suspect. Ironically, Thaddeus Stevens, accused of the murder of an African-American female and her unborn child, became one of the most successful advocates for African-Americans and for civil rights for all in the history of our nation. Stevens rose to national power in Washington, D.C. during the very critical time in our nation's history from 1859 to 1868. He was chair of the very powerful House Ways and Means Committee during the Civil War and was perhaps the most powerful radical Republican in Congress. During the immediate post-wars, Stevens and those who legislated with him in Congress brought about the greatest legislative revolution in the cause of human liberty in the United States since the Bill of Rights was ratified in 1791. In 1865, the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution abolished slavery in the United States forever. In 68, the 14th Amendment granted citizenship to all persons born or naturalized in the United States and prohibited states from making any law that would deprive citizens of life, liberty, or property without due process of law or deny persons equal protection under the law. In 1870, the 15th Amendment extended the vote to African Americans. The vote, the right to vote, shall not be denied by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. In 1860, this was unimaginable. Unimaginable. Within 10 years, it was a reality. <clears throat> Fashioned in the social upheaval of civil war and 600,000 deaths. Liberty rode into town on the point of a bayonet and on the back of Thaddeus Stevens' determination. Today, Stevens is the forgotten giant of the civil rights movement. This morning, we will look at Stevens in Gettysburg. Our story unfolds with the experiences that taught him and the forces that molded him. Stevens was born near Danville, Vermont, on April 4, 1792, the second of four sons born to Sarah and Joshua Stevens. Thaddeus and his older brother Joshua grew up hearing themselves called devil's children. Stephen's mother was a steadfast, unshakable rock in support of her four sons. Stevens prepared for higher education at Peachum Academy in Vermont before entering Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. He graduated from Dartmouth in 1814, moved to York, Pennsylvania in 1815, taught at the York Academy, and studied law part-time in the offices of local attorneys. 24-year-old Stevens moved to Gettysburg in 1816. He would become a Gettysburg regiment resident for the next 26 years. And now we're going to look at the characteristics of Thaddeus Stevens in Gettysburg. First and foremost, he was an outstanding trial attorney. He tried more than 3,000 cases while he was in Gettysburg. He was mentally quick, verbally brilliant, and uncannily ruthless. In one lawsuit that charged trespass, the plaintiff maintained that a cow owned by Stevens' client had destroyed his vegetable garden. An unfortunate passerby witnessed the event and said that he saw the cow eating his neighbor's cabbages. Stevens, 
Did I understand you to say that the cow in the garden was a black cow? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Will you undertake to say that the cow you saw was perfectly black, or was it not lighter in some parts? Now be careful. This is a very important point in your testimony and will affect the decision of the jury. Well, I said it was a black cow to the best of my recollection, but it might have been a little mixed in color. Ah, we are coming to the truth. <laughs> You say it was mixed in color. What do you mean by that? Was it spotted? No, I didn't see any spots on it, but it might have been a little lighter or brindled about the head and breast. A brindled cow, was it? First it was black, then a little mixed in some places, and now brindled. Stevens turned to the jury. Now, gentlemen of the jury, you have heard and must judge of the credibility of a witness who first swears that he saw my client's cow and his neighbor's cabbages. And he swears that the cow was black. Then he admits that the cow might have been partially brindled. In fact, he can't tell what kind of cow it was, as there is no question about the color of my client's cow. This evidence fails to prove the case against him. And Stevens won the case, and that was reported in the Gettysburg Compiler in 1884. In Gettysburg, Thaddeus Stevens was not only an attorney, he was a collector of real estate. He began his, his accumulation in 1818. Next slide. In 1818, he bought his first home at 49 Chambersburg Street, which was called York Street, which was called West York Street at that time, for $1,200. Price was a thousand dollars, but two hundred was added uh, to the mortgage uh, uh, when it was uh, recorded in court as a debt. Now, this portion of the photograph to right here is 49 Chambersburg Street. So this was the first home of Thaddeus Stevens. In 1823, he bought 51. Chambersburg Street, which is this portion of this photograph, and he paid $2,000 for that. So from 1818 until the time he sold this building in 1848, having moved out of town in 1842, this was the home in Gettysburg that he received. There's another biography out, by the way, uh, which identifies this home as the home of Daddy Stevens. That is Stevens never went that. <coughs> but this was Thaddeus Stevens' home and first real estate purchase. This was his first real estate purchase in Gettysburg. Next slide. This is the interior of the front parlor. Think of this. This is French wallpaper. It is called the hunt or the chase. This was produced in France in about 1824 and was purchased by Stevens in 1825. In rural Gettysburg, this must have made quite a stir. Quite a stir. The entire room was wallpapered in this mural type, uh, fox and hounds type uh, wallpaper. Um, next slide. This is another corner of that same room showing the same scene, the hunt. Uh, this wallpaper was subsequently removed in the early 1900s, and so it no longer exists in uh, Gettysburg. Uh, a type of it, or like it, uh, was placed in other American homes of the period. And at one point in time, a representative of this type of wallpaper papered the room in the New York Metropolitan Museum of the Art. And they also identified other areas where uh, this wallpaper existed. In Gettysburg, Stevens has a Gettysburg resident. Stevens purchased more than 100 properties during his lifetime, more than half of them at sheriff's sales. When property is sold at a sheriff's sale, the transaction adds to the impoverished family's pain. 
Opposition newspapers labeled Stevens a dispossessor of widows and orphans because he bought so many homes at <coughs> the sheriff's sale. 500 others called him landlord. By 1830, Stevens was one of the wealthiest men in Gettysburg. At the time of his death in 1868, he owned in Adams County 20,000 acres of land, most of them held in his Caledonia property. In other words, he owned 31 square miles of property. Stevens was a northern iron plantation. Stevens was also a strong supporter of education and no doubt would want us to remember this morning that he was known as the savior of Pennsylvania's Act for Free Public Education. His crowning moment was a speech that he made in Pennsylvania's House of Representatives on April 11, 1835 that was credited with defeating the effort to repeal the 1834 Act of Education that provided free public education for all children in the Commonwealth. Stevens urged the legislators to gamble their political careers and vote for what was right so that the blessing of education shall be conferred on every son of Pennsylvania, shall be carried home to the poorest child of the poorest inhabitant of the meanest hut of your mountains so that even he may be prepared to act well his part in this land of free men and lay on earth a broad and a solid foundation for that enduring knowledge which goes on increasing through increasing eternity. Stevens was also an unreformed, unrepentant, backroom brawling politician. In 1817, at the tender age of 25, Stevens became a vocal member of the Federalist Party. In the mid and late 1820s, Stevens supported John Quincy Adams and his National Republican Party. In August 1829, Staff Thaddeus Stevens and his friends organized the Adams County chapter of the Anti-Masonic Party. Anti-Masonry was a regional single issue political party that arose by riding the outcry against the 1826 murder of William Morgan in upstate New York allegedly by men who were unhappy that Morgan was going to publish Masonic secrets and the apparent later Masonic obstruction of justice in the subsequent trials. Stevens' oratory was always spellbinding. And in 1830, his career spiraled upward at the state anti-Masonic convention and then at the national anti-Masonic convention in Philadelphia where he noted, it is a part of the duty of Masons to aid each other in their business and power and in exalting them to high places. Look around. Though about 100,000 of the people of these United States are Freemasons, yet almost all the high, public, profitable, and higher honor positions are filled with gentlemen of that institution. Out of the number of law judges in the state of Pennsylvania, 1820s are Masons and 22 out of 24 states of the Union are now governed by Masonic chief magistrates. Although not a 20th part of the voters of this Commonwealth and of the United States are Masons, yet they have contrived by concert to put themselves into 18 out of 20 of the offices of profit and power. When this is so, is it because the uninitiated are not fit for office? In 1833, Adams County voters <coughs> Stevens, the first of six one-year terms of the Pennsylvania House in Harrisburg. His tongue was razor sharp. One fellow representative double-crossed Stevens and voted against a measure after assuring Stevens that he would vote for it. <laughs> Sir, do you have any children? Yes, I have three. Ah, that's too bad. I had hoped that you were the last of your race. <laughs> After the 1838 state election for governor and state assembly, each side accused the other of attempting to steal the elections, and in December 1838, Stevens and his allies were forced out of the Capitol building in Harrisburg by an armed mob paid for by Democratic Party money and promises of political patronage. That was called the Buckshot War of 1838. And allegedly, there were three separate plots to assassinate Stevens in Harrisburg that month, cooler heads in the Democratic Party eventually put an end to the plotting Tim. This is the Pennsylvania State Capitol building of that era. The beautiful white 
Capitol building that we have today is a 20th century building. This was the Capitol building from 1822 until 1897 when it burned. This is the state Capitol building that Stevens inhabited. This is uh, the Senate area. This is the House. And uh, on this side, the next to last window in the back is the cloakroom window of the Senate chamber from which Stevens allegedly jumped out of the <coughs> to avoid uh, being murdered or injured by the mob in the Senate chamber uh, during the organization of the Senate. Next. And this <coughs> is a political cartoon from 1840, the uh, Pennsylvania Democratic Political Almanac of 1840. There were numerous political cartoons, and Aaron Cox was the editor of that uh, almanac. Aaron Cox was one of the uh, people who was said in testimony for the House and Senate to have uh, been there with uh, clubs and knives and dirks seen in uh, his hands. He was chasing Thaddeus Stevens, and after Stevens survived, he decided to uh, lampoon him in uh, his press. This is uh, Stevens having jumped out of the window, being caught by a thorn bush, and uh, scared right to death that the mob was going to kill him. And uh, Stevens, in the almanac, says, I haven't been this frightened since the night I awoke in my room with the vision of Dinah standing beside me. So even in 1840, <coughs> came back to I cleaned that up a little bit because that's not exactly what it said in the almanac. But um, uh, you'll have to see what exactly it is. But this type of political cartooning was also common in the area, in the era. When the mob forced Stevens out of power in 38, Democratic Party leaders jumped at the opportunity to end Stevens' pork barrel project, the Tapeworm Railroad, named for its serpentine course through the mountains. This boondoggle moved from Gettysburg West, curved through the mountains, and then on its way to Baltimore and the Ohio Railroad in at the, political, at the Potomac River. The grading for the railroad bed never got farther than the Blue Ridge Summit, and contractors never laid an inch of track. Opponents discovered that the Tapeworms Average cost per mile was $77,340, compared with the Columbia and Philadelphia <coughs> Railroad's cost of $44,000 per mile. All told, the taxpayers of Pennsylvania poured three-quarters of a million dollars into a worthless venture. In August 1842, Stevens moved to Lancaster, ostensibly to practice law in a richer environment and more quickly pay his accumulated debt of $217,000 which would be about $5 million in today's money. In Lancaster, he became an active Whig Party member, as in Gettysburg, he and his allies bought and ran a newspaper in order to promote his party's point of view. Lancastrians elected Stevens to the United States Congress several times, 1849 to 1853 as a Whig, and 1859 until his death in August 1868 as a Republican. The Mariah Iron Furnace near Fairfield that figured prominently in the tapeworm scandal was begun in 1825 and was one of three ironworks owned by Stevens in his lifetime. In 1830, he and another investor opened the Mifflin Forge in what is now Caledonia State Park, 15 miles west of Gettysburg. It burned in 1833, probably a result of arson. In 1837, Stevens and James C. Paxton opened Caledonia Ironworks near the site of the former Mifflin Forge. Stevens operated his ironworks until his death in 1868. Jeb Stewart and his men raided Caledonia Ironworks in 1862, and Jubal Early's men burned the ironworks in June 1863. Stevens estimated his loss at $90,000. In Gettysburg, then, Betty Stevens was a trial lawyer, real estate tycoon, education advocate, politician, state representative, and iron baron. But the legacy for which he is best remembered is his 47-year struggle or civil rights. When Thaddeus Stevens arrived in York, Pennsylvania in 1815, the 23-year-old Vermonter had little experience with slavery. There were no slaves in Vermont when Stevens was growing up. 
its constitution of 1877, of 1777, written when Vermont was an independent republic, had abolished slavery inside the new nation. By 1790, Vermont had joined the Union and the federal census listed only 271 non-whites in the state out of a total population of 85,425. None were slaves. That census does list a few slaves. That's a clerical error. They did not exist. Stevens moved to Gettysburg and began his practice of law in 1816 at a time when he was still grappling with the issue of owning another human being. By the way, I should say that many people in that same area were grappling with the same thing. This was an awakening. This was a time of emancipation in some nations, for example, Great Britain. This was a time of a great awakening of many things, of education, of religion, of care in prison. Owning another human being, this, these attitudes were changing also. Stevens is not the only one in Gettysburg who was thought to be well-educated and high-minded. Uh, Samuel Simon Schmucker, the founder of the seminary, uh, was grappling and wrestling with the same thing. He has quite a complex story. From 1816 to 1822, uh, the record of Thaddeus Stevens' early law practice reveals his ambivalence. Gettysburg attorneys worked both sides of the street. From 1816 to 1822, Stevens argued seven times for freedom. On four occasions, the slaves were free. Now, what I mean by that is he was involved in a court case <coughs> where uh, the uh, plaintiff was uh, either the state or an attorney or a family who were suing for a slave's freedom, and uh, someone else was defending the slave owner against that. On four occasions, the slaves were freed. One time, Stevens lost, and the slave remained in servitude, and the results of two suits are unknown. During the same years, Stevens represented the slaveholder four times. He worked both sides of the street. On three occasions, Stevens lost, and the slave went free. On one occasion, the Charity Butler case, Stevens won and three human beings were sent back into slavery, probably for the rest of their lives. In August 1820, Henry Butler, an African-American free resident of Adams County, sued Maryland slave owner John Delaplane to recover his wife and two daughters. Years earlier, it's kind of complicated, but, but basically years earlier, slave charity had run away crossed the Mason-Dixon line and married Henry Butler. They had two daughters, Harriet and Sophia. Eventually, John Delaplane, who was not her original slave owner in Maryland, he purchased the plantation and all the slaves on it. Eventually, John Delaplane found out where they were living. You know, there were uh, people who sold such information south. Uh, and then he kidnapped them back into slavery in Maryland. In court, Henry claimed that Charities interrupted visits to Pennsylvania as a child with the implied consent of her then owner had qualified her for freedom under Pennsylvania's Act of Gradual Abolition of Slavery of 1780. The claim was dubious at best and a blatant fabrication at worst. But it was all they had. It was all they had. Thaddeus Stevens represented slave owner John Delaplane first at the local court level and later at the state Supreme Court trial that was sitting in, the Supreme Court was sitting in Chambersburg at that time. The state Supreme Court was kind of a circuit court that moved from town to town at that time. There were, uh, there were noted, uh, ten, there were designated towns to which they would go. And they didn't change randomly. The law was clear and Stevens won at the Supreme Court level. The agony of that black family as they were torn apart in the courtroom for the last time must have been gut-wrenching.
Stevens was devastated at what he had done. But life is never quite as straightforward as what it seems. Remember Stevens worked both sides of the, of the street. At the very same time, he was representing slave holder and owner Delaplane. He was also the plaintiff's attorney in Gettysburg courts, suing for freedom for three other African Americans, Eunice Reed, James Snively, and Abraham Snively. They had been kidnapped across the Mason-Dixon line into Maryland, actually into Emmitsburg, Maryland, and were suing an Adams County court <coughs> to gain their freedom. And Stevens was representing them at the same time in five jury trials. Five jury trials. November 1820, June 1821, August 1821, November 1821, and April 1822, Stevens argued for freedom. We have no record of what he said, but we have the judgment dockets of those trials. The first trial, he lost, but it was, but he was granted, or the uh, plaintiffs were granted a new trial based on a technicality that he took back and won at court. In the second trial, there was a hung jury. In the third trial, there was a hung jury. In the fourth trial, there was a hung jury. And in the fifth trial, after Stevens had preached liberty to 60 Adams County jurors over 18 months, the verdict that Stevens and the three African Americans had waited to hear was announced. The verdict was recorded. Twelve good and lawful men of the county of Adams, who on their respective oaths and affirmations do find for the plaintiffs. Verdict. 14th April 1822. Three human beings went free. You know, I wish I could have heard what he said. I wish I knew what he said. Stevens, one of the reasons why Stevens argued so hard for the right of trial by jury was contained in one of the things that de Tocqueville said in his book on the American culture. And de Tocqueville said that he had observed that in America, public opinion is swayed by the arguments in court. And Stevens knew that. He preached liberty to 60 Adams County jurors. And at the end, after five trials, he was able to convince 12 men that he was right. And they went free. There's a film out called Cry Freedom. And it uh, outlines the story of Stephen Bilko, who was uh, South African uh, activist who was murdered while in police custody. And it's a Stephen, it, it, it's a uh, Attenborough film. And when I first saw this film going through it, I thought, well, you know, this is probably an aberration. But at the end of the film, one of the things that Attenborough does is scroll through the list of names of people who died custody in South Africa. And as the scroll moves on, minute after minute after minute, you come to an understanding of the enormity of the crime. Sixty jurors he preached liberty to. I wish I had been there to see what he said. Thaddeus Stevens' first recorded public pronouncement on slavery was reported in the Sentinel on Independence Day, July the 4th, 1823, at a celebration at George Hurst's Tavern on the Square, which is now known as the Gatesburg Hotel. <clears throat> a toast by Thaddeus Stevens. To the next president, may he be a free man who never fed riveted fetters on a human being. Stevens developed a reputation 
for defending the oppressed. Perhaps he saw himself as a victim of discrimination, an outsider, the poor boy whose father had deserted the family, the devil's child with the left club foot. After Stevens' death, Congressman Godlove Forth told Congress that during Stevens' early life in Gettysburg, the cases of fugitive slaves were quite numerous and where arrests were made, which came to his knowledge, he invariably volunteered his services to defend the alleged slave, and it is among the reminiscences of the neighborhood that he seldom, if ever, failed to secure the freedom of his clients. By the way, I'd like to say at this point in time that from time to time, somebody surfaces with an idea that uh, the time frame here is incorrect. They say that they find cases after the uh, Charity Butler case in which Thaddeus Stevens represented the slave holder in order to maintain the slave in bondage. Uh, I have looked into cases such as that and have never found one that is correct. Uh, most recently, uh, there was a, a section of a PhD dissertation uh, that passed, uh, which was just plainly incorrect and was based on uh, insufficient uh, research, basically. The year 1836 seemed to be the watershed in Thaddeus Stevens' life, a time when he made his move away from his private war against local slavery to a public embrace of the struggle to end slavery in the United States. Stevens already employed African Americans in his household and at his iron furnaces. He also defended African Americans in court, both free and fugitive. And it was widely believed in Adams County that he used his many properties throughout the county to hide runaway slaves on their trek northward. But in 1836, Stevens the 46th session of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives received a series of, revolution, of resolutions sent from the legislatures of Virginia, Kentucky, and Mississippi to several northern states. The southern states demanded that northern states pass laws to punish those of her citizens who, in defiance of their social duty and that of the Constitution, assail her safety and tranquility by forming associations for the abolition of slavery, printing, publishing, and circulating seditious or incendiary publications designed, calculated, or having a tendency to operate on her population. The resolutions also asserted that Congress had no right to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia or the United States territories, and that any action by Congress to do so would bring the Union into peril. In Pennsylvania, <coughs> the resolutions from Virginia primarily, but also Kentucky and Mississippi, were forwarded to the House Judiciary Committee chaired by Thaddeus Stevens. Under his chairmanship, the committee returned a report that lambasted the southern states' demands. The committee are compelled by a sense of duty which they owe to Pennsylvania as a sovereign and independent state and to themselves as free men to deny the right of Virginia or any other state to claim from us any legislation of the character referred to in these resolutions. Every citizen of the non-slaveholding states has a right freely to think and publish his thoughts on any subject of national or state policy. Slavery not only exists within the district over which Congress has exclusive jurisdiction, but it is understood to be an extensive market for the sale of slaves. To witness droves of human beings bound together with iron fetters and lashed forward to hopeless servitude by free men, descanting loudly and boastfully on the blessing of liberty is a moral anomaly which fails to shock only because of its familiarity. The House of Representatives tabled the report too frightened to offend the southern states, but Stevens's words were in the record. On December 6, 1836, Pennsylvania Governor Joseph Ritter, Rittner sent his annual message to the legislator, legislature in writing. It contained the first public condemnation of slavery by a northern governor. The governor condemned, quote, the base bowing of the knee to the dark spirit of slavery. The governor's mention continued. Not only has Pennsylvania thus expelled the evil from her borders, but she has on all proper occasions endeavored to guard younger sisters from the pollution. 
these tenants the opposition to slavery at home, which by the blessing of Providence has been rendered effectual, opposition to the admission into the union of the new slaveholding states, and opposition to slavery in the District of Columbia, the very heart and domestic abode of the national horror have ever been and are the cherished doctrines of our state. Let us fellow citizens stand by and maintain them unshrinkingly and fearlessly. Most in the South believe that Thaddeus Stevens wrote those words. When the governor's message was printed in Southern newspapers, slaveholders <coughs> seethed with rage. In the spring of 1837, in Harrisburg, Stevens gave American, Ant American Anti-Slavery Society lecturer Jonathan Blanchard $90 and letters of introduction to certain men in Gettysburg to set up a series of debates on slavery. During one session, the crowd became unruly and threw eggs at Blanchard. Stevens was wisely out of town for the egg throwing. When he learned of Blanchard's treatment, he returned to Gettysburg and attacked. In another meeting, in public at the courthouse, Blanchard wrote a description of what he saw happen. Stevens got up to speak. To attempt to describe either the speech or its effect would be like attempting to paint a thunderstorm. He came to freedom of speech, which the recent mob had violated. There comes along a universalist here and you put him up and hear him deny all the doctrines that Christ and the apostles preached. He passes on and no harm done. But there comes along another man to preach in favor of universal liberty. And him you answer with violence and rotten eggs. Oh, shame. Shame. What freeman does not feel himself covered all over with burning blushes to find himself surrounded by such free men. In May 1837, 133 convention delegates, including Thaddeus Stevens, began their deliberations to write a new Pennsylvania Constitution in the Capitol building in Harrisburg. That's where it began. The convention turned out to be incredibly important in the civil rights movement in America, but not because Thaddeus Stevens and civil rights activists succeeded. No, the convention was important because Thaddeus Stevens lost almost every motion he championed. He lost. His abrasiveness, intransigence, and unwillingness to compromise were to trade votes doomed his causes. The convention was a disaster for Stevens, but it was in the lessons learned and in bitter defeat that Stevens gained the knowledge and experience to succeed on the national level in the 1860s. Because of his abrasive and high-handed tactics, Stevens lost his effort also to extend the right of trial by jury to fugitive slaves, and he lost his battle to defeat the proposal to insert the word white into Pennsylvania's constitutional requirements for voter qualifications on January 20th, 1838. The convention ended in Philadelphia on Washington's birthday. February 22, 1838, and Stevens was so disgusted that he refused to sign the convention's report. Stevens told the delegates, I believe myself that the voice of the people, when they are right, is the voice of God. <coughs> Truth is one of the attributes of divinity. But when the popular voice is founded upon ignorance and passion, it breathes anything else than divine wisdom. The popular voice when founded in error, resembles that of the pagan gods. About the same time, Stevens proposed a motion in the state legislature to extend the right of trial by jury to fugitive slaves, it passed the House, but was defeated in the Senate. Another nail was driven into the civil rights coffin by the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court on March 13, 1838, when it declared voting by Pennsylvania's African Americans to be unconstitutional under the state's constitution of 1790. Later that fall, after white voters ratified the constitution of 1838, the one that Stevens had refused to sign, African Americans found themselves totally disenfranchised in Pennsylvania. 
Stevens' experience in the legislature and the courts taught him the importance of creating constitutional safeguards for civil rights. His experience during Pennsylvania's Constitution Convention of 1838 taught him how difficult it was to insert those guarantees into a constitution. Stevens' May 4, 1838 letter to a committee on the occasion of their dedication of Pennsylvania Hall, a newly constructed abolitionist center in Philadelphia, illustrated his views and his brilliant oratory. Mm -hmm. Stevens wrote, the slaveholder claims his prey by virtue of that constitution, which contradicts the vital principles of our Declaration of Independence. But while it remains unchanged, it must be supported. If his heart exacts the fulfillment of the cruel bond, the slaveholder's heart, let him take the pound of flesh but not one drop of blood. This we must yield to existing laws, not to our sense of justice. But I can never acknowledge the right of slavery. I will bow down to no deity, however dignified by the name of the goddess of liberty, whose footstool is the crushed necks of groaning millions, and who rejoices in the resoundings of the tyrant's lash, and the cries of his tortured victims. In public, Thaddeus Stevens fought against slavery in the legal system. There is also circumstantial evidence that Thaddeus Stevens was deeply involved in the Underground Railroad in Adams County. The loose-lit network was illegal and written records were not kept. However, one of the first things obvious about the Underground Railroad in South Central Pennsylvania is that many of the names of known participants were Stevens' friends or employees. In 1911, Hiram Wurtz's experience as a conductor on the Underground Railroad near Quincy, Franklin County were published. When night came, I led the fugitive slaves north about eight miles to a settlement called Africa. This was near the old Caledonia Furnace, owned by that great champion of the slave, Thaddeus Stevens. Twenty or twenty-five families of colored people lived there and near the village of Greenwood. That village is still there, by the way, today. In this matter, in this place, was the home of Robert Black, who saw to it that the fugitives were cared for, working along with William Hammett, then the superintendent of Stevens' furnace which was located two miles to the east. From this point, they were piloted through the mountains by way of Pine Grove Furnace to Mount Holly and Boiling Springs, and from there they were sent safely over the Susquehanna River. Robert Middleton, editor of the Anti-Masonic Star, the newspaper that Stevens founded and supported financially, was a prominent member of the Adams County Anti-Slavery Society. William C. Clarkson, the superintendent of Stevens' Tapeworm Railroad Project, was a member and active supporter of the same society. Stevens represented Underground Railroad families in court many times, the McAllisters, the Wrights, and the Wirelands. And to this day, many of Stevens' properties have oral histories passed from one owner to another about the hiding places in the basement, in the attic, or elsewhere where runaway slaves were hidden. In March, 1853, while in Lancaster, Stevens' second term in the United States House ended, and he returned to the private practice of law in, in Lancaster. He continued in the company of Lydia Hamilton Smith, the African-American widow from Adams County, whom he had hired as a housekeeper in 1848. In 1855, Stevens and others organized the Republican Party in Pennsylvania. He attended the party's national convention in 1856 in Philadelphia. In August 1858, he was nominated as a Republican candidate for the House of Representatives from Lancaster. In his acceptance speech, Stevens said, he was opposed to slavery. He was opposed to it everywhere, not only because slavery was opposed to free white labor, but because slavery was wrong, oppressive, barbaric. He had been accused of being an abolitionist. If what he had just said made him an abolitionist, then he was one. You see, he said, what the animal is like. In 1822 in Gettysburg, Stevens began his struggle against slavery locally. In 1836, as a state representative from Gettysburg, his struggle turned to the state level, some say even the national level. Along the way, he developed a strategy of denunciation and denial. 
As attorney and state legislator, he learned that laws can be repealed by legislatures and overturned by courts. He learned the value, the primacy of the federal constitution and how he failed to achieve his goals. At the 1838 Pennsylvania Constitutional Reform Convention, he learned the value of compromise. At the 1838 State Constitutional Reform Convention, Stevens had said, don't hunt the small game. In the, eight, in the United States House in the 1860s, he hunted the big game of civil rights. And he did it with compromise and with constitutional amendments. On June 13, 1866, in the House of Representatives, Thaddeus Stevens spoke in support of the proposed 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. In my youth, in my manhood, in my old age, I had fondly dreamed that when any fortunate chance should have broken up for a while the foundation of our institutions and released us from obligations the most tyrannical that ever man imposed in the name of freedom, that the intelligent, pure, and just men of this republic, true to their professions and consciences, <coughs> would have so remodeled all our institutions as to have freed them from every vestige of human oppression, of inequality of rights, of the recognized degradation of the poor, and the superior caste of the rich. Did you hear it? Did you hear it? Perhaps, the construction of that paragraph contains some oratorical device. Surely it does. It's a well-written paragraph. But did you hear what he's telling us? In my youth, in my manhood, in my old age, I had fondly dreamed. How old was he when that dream began? On how many nights did he dream it? How many nights did he as a little boy cry himself to sleep because someone had, had maligned him because of his club foot, because of his poverty, because he wasn't of the right class? He's telling us that dream persisted all his life. but he believed he'd failed. This bright dream has vanished like the basis fabric of a vision. Boy, that's Shakespeare. I find that we shall be obliged to be content with patching up the worst portions of the ancient edifice and leaving it in many of its parts to be swept through by the tempest, the frost, and the storms of despotism. And then, then the old man talked about compromise. Do you inquire why? Holding these views and possessing some will of my own, I accept so imperfect a proposition. I answer because I live among men and not among angels, among men as intelligent, as determined, and as independent as myself, who not agreeing with me, do not choose to yield their opinions to mine. Mutual concession, therefore, is our only resort for mutual hostilities. The child, then, was indeed the father of the man. And the young man in Gettysburg did indeed shape the old man in Congress. During his Gettysburg years, that is Stevens, one, moved to an anti-slavery position. Two, moved to an activist position throughout the state and throughout the United States. Three, move from a position of intransigence to an understanding of compromise. And four, came to value the importance of placing those human rights in our federal constitution. Thaddeus Stevens became a leader in Congress's journey to civil rights, and that topic will be taken up in a few minutes by Dr. Palmer. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to have a, about a half hour break so you can get coffee, use the facility, and then Doc, uh, Ms. Palmer will speak. Okay?